Yeah, at 12 years old, uh, I caught my first felony. Dude, I was sitting there watching him molest my sister. She took me in, she took me to church. If it wasn't for her taking me to church, I wouldn't be probably this far in life. What's good, y'all? Your boy Brandon back again. Another episode of the On Road Podcast, man. This week in the studio, I got a fellow podcaster out of the city of Las Vegas. We got the Quan Spates, man, host of the Off Limits Podcast. Thank you for coming in, bro. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. It's, it's definitely an honor, man. I love, I love what y'all do, man. Y'all podcast is so genuine and so, like, just natural. And that's one thing I like to, I, I like to be attached to in general is, like, I, I like to be around that type of environment. I looked at like some of y'all clips and y'all just having fun with it. And that's nah, for sure. I was like, okay, let me come on, bro. Like that's that's what it's all about, man, having fun. So I appreciate you for having me for sure. Yes, that's sir, amazing. yes, sir. Is this your first collab? Like on uh, your first time being on somebody else's podcast? Yeah, bro. And it feel weird. Like, cause yeah. like I'm not the one doing the interview. Exactly. So it's like You don't know what's coming. Yeah, you kinda, like yeah, I'm yeah. not in a hot seat. No, yeah, for sure, so, for well sure. now I am, but yeah, no, it's that's it's definitely my first one, man. And I was like, okay, and I'm not used to like always like being interviewed but i always told people like i want my story to be out there to where you never know who it might help so yeah man it's it's a it's a blessing man not 100 percent. and i was watching uh one of your early one of your first podcasts the first one i believe that's on your youtube so yeah. if people want to go check it out so you get a better idea of what i'm talking about you kind of break down your reasoning as to why you started the podcast sort yeah. of you talk a little bit about your life story but mm -hmm. you even mentioned there that you didn't want to you didn't want to uh cover it all because you wanted to yeah. you wanted it to happen with somebody else so you can kind of get a little conversation yeah, going, which i feel is is better because you get two perspectives. You get to like talk it through a little yeah. bit. So Facts. let's break that down. You're originally from uh, Waterloo, Iowa. Is yeah, that Waterloo, Iowa, man. Uh, that that's where it all started, man. Waterloo, Iowa, for sure. Yeah. And how old were you when you came to Vegas? Oh, dude, I was. I'm 28, about 25, 26. I haven't been here that long. Oh, okay. So yeah. you're brand new to the city. Brand almost. new. I lived. Uh, I lived off of Nellis when I first moved here, bro. Oh, I lived like right across the air uh, from the air base, and then uh, me and my fiance, we were like, "Nah, let's move." And went to Henderson. That's where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it much was better area, huh? Oh yeah, it's much better. But man, Vegas. I tell people I'm never going back home. No, never. Vegas is so like. One, it, it's so heartwarming in general. Once you meet those genuine people, it taught me a lot. But yeah, Waterloo, Iowa is my home, man. Yeah. yeah. So, what was it like going from a small place like that to like a bigger city like Las Vegas? That's a good question, man. I ain't gonna lie. I'm gonna keep it a buck. I was scared. I was scared because I had a lot on my plate. Um, I had a lot of people that depended on me. Not only that, but uh, my fiance and my kids, because um, I have four kids and not only just having a lot on my plate man i had to pray to god before moving here took me a year in the process to even move here because i was praying asking god like is this the right thing to do because i'm leaving two kids behind mm -hmm. i'm just gonna call it for what it is not like actually just leaving them out of their life but you know me and the mom of my two older kids which is now uh you know my heart overall but it's like dang uh, am i leaving them fully but me and the mom just don't get along and we we have a court order and everything. So I'm not, you know, too concerned about that overall. But I was leaving a lot behind. But also coming here, I have two other kids with my now fiance in general to where I have to think about their future. 100 percent. Yeah. So that's what that's what tri uh, striked it. I never been to Vegas. Me or her, Sadie, never been to Vegas. What, what was it about Vegas that I'm, made you bruh, think about? I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Look, I just was like, where should we move? Vegas was the first name that popped up in my mind. I was like, let's go. Never been to Vegas, never wanted to come to Vegas. I had a friend that used to live here in Vegas, but he ended up moving back home like three months, four months into me living here. Mm. Um, we were close friends in high school. He moved here straight out of high school, but it didn't, he didn't have that influence on me to move um, from Iowa to here. Right. It was just Vegas. That was just, It was just like the luck of the draw, dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nah, that's dope. I guess... Something about the city. I mean, I would say personally, as someone who was born and raised here, 
there's really not a there couldn't be a better time to move yeah. here than right Facts. now. Just how much the city's growing, the opportunities that are coming here. Like it, it it's a big city, but it yeah. still has like a small town feel. People here are real close. Like Facts. if you know five people, you probably know everybody yeah. in Vegas. Like everybody's yeah. so connected. Yeah. And that's the best thing about this is like people like us who are doing podcasts or doing content. Like yeah. we're one of the first people here yeah. compared to like if you move to LA or you move somewhere everybody's else. Everybody's like, doing it. Everybody's doing yeah. it. Like on and every that, block there's five podcasts. And, shit, and, and that's what I tell people is and that's a good place to definitely like network. But when I first started, like when I first moved to Vegas, I worked on Fremont. That was my first job. Mm -hmm. And now my second job, which is what I'm currently at. Um, I ain't gonna tell y'all, but that's completely different than like Fremont because yeah. I was working law enforcement in general ever since I was 17 up until I just left on Fremont. So my first job was like in the in the. I was in the mix right away. Yeah. And I yeah, like Fremont's I, like as crazy as it gets here. Bro, when yeah. I hey, I'm gonna keep it real. When I first moved here and I started working on Fremont, bro, I was scared. Cause like I'm like, ain't no way I'm I'm working here on Fremont. And like in Iowa, we don't have anything like Fremont. Right. We don't have we have like one casino. We don't have like no eight block radius of people just walking, having fun, looking at stages or nothing like that. So it was all new to me. And I'm like, I love it though. <laughs> like, I love it. I mean, it was like I was partying every night. No, for sure. Oh, it was it was lit. Yeah. <laughs> it was lit. It was lit. But let's wheel it back a little bit because yeah. you also have, as much as we can sit here now and laugh at and uh, congratulations and um, on on you know being successful, yeah. coming to the city, getting established. Sure. Um, I hope everything goes well for you, oh, for your family, that, for your That's kids. Love. Absolutely. But uh, you know, as much as things are good now, there was a point in time where things weren't so good for you. Yeah. You had a little bit of a difficult upbringing. Uh, you spoke about that on your video, and I want to break that down a little bit for people just so we can get a better understanding of where yeah. you're coming from and what it took to get from yeah. where you were to where you are now. Yeah. So do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Hey, this dude did his research. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so growing up, man, it was always tough for me specifically because my dad was never around. Uh, it's more normal in the African American culture that the dad is not around. And it's, I mean, that's just something how it is in a way, but my dad was never there. He's been locked up in prison ever since I was maybe six or seven around that uh, age in general. And he went to, he went to prison for murder. So I never had him. Um, my mom, she was there physically and she always did what she, you know, had to do or tried to do what she needed to do to be a mom. But alcohol got involved. You know, she was a, a real addict when it came to that. Um, it's been times to I remember like just growing up, like we couldn't we couldn't eat. So I had to go outside and rob people. I had to go outside and hang out with, you know, my old friends now, obviously. But back then, the role models for me was the gangbangers. Absolutely. So my family was this huge gang oriented family from my dad's side. So it it was times where I'm put in situations and I never knew or understood why just based off my, you know, dad's side of the family. And so my mom, you know, around that six, seven or eight, even even nine a little bit, like my mom, she was just always going out drinking, always going out with her friends and just leaving me at the house with my sister. And I talk about it a little bit on my podcast, but um, like my sister, she had she started going through. Uh, those dark times too as well at an older age because we're three years apart. Is she so, older or younger than you? Yeah, she's older than me. Okay. Yeah, she's older than me. So she was my big sister. I was the baby. No, of course. Yeah. And so I remember the time specifically where my mom left. My sister was out, out of the house. As soon as my mom left, my sister would always leave to go party and do whatever she want. And I was just stuck at home or outside getting in trouble. And yeah, it was, it was like that up in... Uh, it was like that up until middle school until I got not legally adopted, but until my grandmother and my now mom took me in. So for y'all that don't know, um, I got adopted from my grandmother and my mom's sister, which is my aunt, but mm -hmm. I call her my mom. So when I'm referring to my mom, 90% of the time I'm talking about my aunt um, in general now, but my biological mom, man, even to this day, I love, I love her so much and we're, we're close. Um, but yeah, she put me through a lot. She, she put me through a lot. She tried her best. Don't get me wrong. She, there's nothing more, there's nothing stronger in this world that I believe is, you know, other than a black queen. 
she did everything that she could to try to keep me away. It just wasn't enough. Yeah. And how difficult was it to cope without having a father? Because obviously for mm -hmm. guidance, for, for even just for small things, right? Like teaching you how to do things, yeah. even if it's just playing sports, riding a bike, yeah. but also the more important life lessons, like, you know, how to stand up for yourself, how to yeah. be a stand up man, how to take care of your home, your family. Yeah. How difficult was it to learn those lessons by, you know, not having a father, not just not having a role model, but you could almost even say like having somebody that's teaching you the opposite yeah. because they're pushing you in that direction. I would say I'm 28 and I haven't had my biological father in my life ever since six, a little bit of seven. Um, I'm still learning. Um, it was super difficult because like you mentioned, he wasn't there to come to my football games. He wasn't there to give me those life lessons. He wasn't there to tell me how to treat a female um, because he had multiple different females by the time, shit, I could even remember. Um, so it was so hard. And I remember times where I used to cry to my mom and be like, does he not love me? Like, what did he do? I didn't understand the reason why my dad actually went to prison up until I was maybe a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. But not having him in my life created anger. It created depression. It created anxiety. And I'm going to be blunt honest, like, bro, I'm just now figuring out that I have anxiety. And you have to sometimes think so far back to what triggers that. And I always go back and tell people all of the time, like, dude, I feel even now I feel more comfortable in the ghetto than I do like the suburbs. A hundred percent. And that's just how it is. It's not anything bad against people that live in the suburbs. It's just a familiarity. Like yeah. you know it. You know yeah. how to walk there. I know, versus yeah, I know how yeah. I can walk. I know I can just, what's up, bro? Don't talk to this person. Yeah, I can talk, talk to, to you. Yeah, can't that's go how here, it was, there, bro. Yeah. And so I wouldn't say that a lot of, I, I learned in life that everything that my dad caused and that he, not intentionally, but what he put on me, I had to learn how to reroute that and make it a positive. No, for sure. But my dad not being there gave me a lot of negatives, bro, that I had to learn how to fix and that I'm still learning how to fix. Like, man, like I'll get in deep, I'll get in deep to it. But yeah, my dad not being around, bro, it was heavy. It was heavy for, for sure. Real. And as somebody that uh, has worked in law enforcement, you mm -hmm. can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we grow up hearing these stories of people that are in the military or in mm -hmm. law enforcement and how they get PTSD because they're around these stressful situations yeah. all the time. Something that's not talked about enough is people that grow up in environments mm -hmm. where there's violence, where there's gangs, where there's poverty. Mm -hmm. We go through those same things. Yeah, facts. Now imagine if a grown man gets PTSD from going to war, which is of course understandable. Oh, yeah. Salute to all those people. Yeah. Imagine what those environments do to children that are yeah. five, six, seven exactly. years old. And we don't talk about it, and they yeah. we grow up and are expected to function as normal people yeah. in society. Where, not to make excuses, because of course wrong is wrong, but yeah. how in a way like how can you blame these people right. when how from you? six years old this is all you've known? Yeah. You don't know, and then you get incarcerated, you come out. You don't know how to behave in yeah. regular society. You don't you know don't. how to get a job. Yeah, you don't you know don't. how to treat people. You don't know how to control your anger. You don't know all these things. Yeah. So it, it's, would I be correct to say that? No, that's 100% correct because growing up, and I'm not going to speak for all African-American households, but a, a majority of African-American households were actually taught and raised not to like someone in uniform as in law enforcement. It's not always described why, how, or you should or shouldn't, but I just know specifically in my household and a lot of my other friends that were coming from that same environment, maybe a different side of the town from the west side to east side, was always taught not to like law enforcement. So when I was 17 and I first got involved into becoming like a resource, like a um, reserve police officer, man, do you not know I got turned down so many times for wanting to be a police officer from the professionals? Mm. I had a police officer, a captain, looked me dead in my face and was like, no, nah, I don't want you because your last name is Spates. I'm, I'm like, what that got to do with me? And so we can backtrack on this too because once I, once I state it, you're probably going to be like, what? But at 11 and a half, 12 years old, I had my first felony, mm. high-class felony. I had actually, that wasn't my first, that wasn't my only one. It was my first one, but I had a, cl a class A um, for, for robbery. And that's just hanging around the wrong people. And a lot of my, a, a lot of my groups, right? We branched out and created our own gangs. We created our own little groups, um, you know, because that's just, that's what, that's what it was. Right. Our families 
were uh, the originators. Like my dad, his brothers and sisters, they were the leader of some of the major gangs there in Iowa. We controlled half of the, the drugs and the crime there in my city. And that's a fact. And so I always knew that I had protection wherever I went. No doubt about it. If I go back there, even to this day, like there's no You're one good. that can touch me. There's yeah. no one that can come up to me without, bro. I tell I tell people all the time, like oh, I'm a, I'm gonna fight you one on one, but just know that they might not, right. you know. Yeah, and it, yeah. and that lifestyle, and it, and sometimes I think about it. It's sad to say it, but that lifestyle, that culture, created some type of positivity too. Knowing that I'm always safe in my own city, in my own home. If I were to go back home in general, that's that's kind of like that that's kind of a positive for me oh, for sure for like for real i mean you got those people out there that you know obviously want to hurt you and whatever but i can go anywhere and it, but yeah man it's it, it's tough dog it, it's definitely tough but at yeah at 12 years old uh i caught my first felony for robbery dog it was a dude riding down the street on a like coming from uh, high school, just right down the street on a bike. And he, it was right when those Beats came out, the Beats headphones. Oh, yeah. It was a thousand dollars almost. Yeah, yeah. He had that with an iPod just and some money. Shit. Oh, yeah. Over like 700 was a felony. Yeah, so, yeah. All, right, all right, cool. <laughs> so it was almost <laughs> dangerous. It was almost more dangerous for me not to do what my gang member leaders told me than no, get caught sure. by the cops. Yeah. That's just a fact. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, yeah. I just, that's just how it was, dog. No, like, not, only is it, not only is it more dangerous because that's the politics but yeah. i mean just as a kid bro you 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 do what you do to fit in like yeah. every kid is going to adapt to their environment yeah. it's that's all you see that's what you're going to fall yeah. into and it's very very hard to see in a different way yeah. you almost have to like be separated or be isolated yeah. so you can learn what else is there going on in the world oh i don't have to go down this road i yeah. can go over here or over there yeah but it's difficult um, but what about the relationship with your mom? What mm -hmm. was it like? Do you remember what it was like? Like when your father first was incarcerated, do you remember mm -hmm. how the relationship was with your mom? Uh, yeah, man, it was, it was always the same all the way up until I'm gonna be honest up until I moved to Vegas, dog. Like it was, it was almost the same because she, she was also still getting in trouble too. She was in and out of jail. Uh, she went to jail for a year period of time to where, um, my grandmother took over to care for me. My granny took me over uh, when I was in seventh grade, about, well, about sixth grade going into seventh, she kind of took over responsibilities. So from, you got to think from seventh grade all the way down, my mom was in and out. You know, my relationship, I always had love for her. I was a mama's boy. I always wanted to be up underneath her, but again, I, I, I only could do so much as a kid. And so my mom had, she went through so much. I'm not going to lie. My mom went through so much because my older sister, she almost gave my older sister up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So my older sister would also use that as leverage against my mom. To, like, you know, almost as hate. And then my mom would feel guilty and start drinking. It was a cycling effect, dude. And it, man, I'm going to touch on it. But I remember, and sometimes, and I'm going to get deep a little bit, but I remember my mom used to try to put us in better situations. So my mom used to give us, like these opportunities or bring up like, hey, I'm about to enroll you guys in a camp. I'm about to enroll you guys into mentors, like the big brother, big sister program, right? So me and my sister said, yeah, to, to do the same one. We, we get signed up. Um, and my sister, we meet the guy, he sound, he's genuine, Caucasian dude. He had his big house on it, like the, what we call the east side. Mm -hmm. We would go over there, have fun, eat lunch and dinner and everything like that. Me and my sister was always staying together. The one day that me and my sister, we had went to like this farm. We had went to like this farm. He was going to show us how to pick corn and stuff like that. We called it back home, detasseling. And um, I remember my sister getting on the tractor in front of him and I was in the back. Dude, I was sitting there watching him molest my sister. And in my mind, I'm thinking that shit was normal because I see it all the time in my, in my neighborhood. I'm sitting there watching it happen. And my sister was like, my sister was like, nah, like it is no, it's not normal. He ended up getting caught, uh, had to testify and everything. Statements came up. Um, he ended up going to jail up until probably, uh, I would say about five, well, about four years ago. I was working at Best Buy, bro. I was working at Best Buy. And I saw him walk in for the first time since I was a little baby. Well, not a baby, but a, yeah, yeah, uh, kid, I, I, yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. I saw him walk in. 
And I was like, he started checking out. And I kid you not, right hand to God, bro, I cannot make this up. He started checking out. This is also when I kind of figured out that I had something wrong with me as in like anxiety. Um, he walks in front of, he comes to me. It's like God specifically put him in front of me. Right. Like all of the cashiers that was open, you come to me. Right. But uh, he starts checking. I was like, hey, you look familiar. He was like, no, you probably don't know me. I was like, yeah, I do. He was like, no. I was like, all right. So I start checking him out. He had a whole bunch of stuff. I was like, you live in that house on the east side, huh? The house was still there. I was like, he was like, yeah, I live on the east side. I was like, you had this, you got this big ass green, like, a uh, ball in your yard. Like, it was like a, I don't know what the hell. It was like a um, a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you got this big green sculpture in your yard. He goes, yeah, how you know that? I was like, yeah, because you molested my sister. And bro, my coworkers that was standing right next to me, they looked at me. Bro, that day God had his hands on me. Because I was like, bro, I could kill you right now. In my mind, all of the thoughts went went through. Everything went through my head. I called my mom, my aunt. I was like, I just saw him. I was like, wow, we knew he was getting out, but not that quick. Man, that day I could have ended dude life. But God had his hands. But, yeah, it's, it's situations like that that, you know, we've seen too often. i seen too often murder, rape, everything, dog. Like living in Waterloo, being in just that gang family-oriented style, I saw that every day. So yeah, it's 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 a wild man. It's wild. And what's your relationship like with your sister? Are you close? Uh, I I'll, I'll say like we're closer than what we ever been. Yeah, uh, we still love each other. You know, to this day, um, my one goal, and I'll tell y'all this: I have two. I I had three goals technically that I always wanted to accomplish with me having a podcast. Get my sister on a podcast and talk about it, because even to this day, me and her never talked about that. To this day, we never sat down and talked about that. Um, two, I always wanted to take my grandmother back to England to visit her family because that's where my family originated from. Three, I want to have Keith Lee on my podcast. That's it. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's my three podcast yeah. goals right there. But, yeah, my relationship with uh, my sister is I love her dearly. I love her with all my heart. I mean, we, we're like two peas in a pot when we're together. That's beautiful, uh, you man. know, so yeah, I I love that. I love that girl, and cause she 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 goes through so much too. Cause she even to this day she's still taking care of my mom. Like my mom is living with her right now in mm -hmm. Kentucky because my mom can't really, my mom doesn't have that backbone to actually survive on her own. Cause she's so addicted to alcohol, bro. That's how it is. Yeah, and it it's something that's very common especially in minority communities the mm -hmm. fact that we don't talk about stuff yeah like at all yeah tragedy happens trauma mm -hmm. happens all these fucked up things happen and mm -hmm. we just don't talk about it we right. almost like sweep it under the rug and yeah. pretend it didn't happen and it's always an elephant in the room because as much as we think oh they don't remember anymore yeah. they don't think about it it's like bro yeah. if you're thinking about it they're thinking about it oh yeah facts so yeah w why do you think that is I think it's also because a lot of times people are scared to tap in to their inner selves. A lot of times people can't do what we do and sit in front of people and discuss and communicate their problems. I think a lot of times people are too in tune with themselves in a negative aspect. They keep it all bottled up instead of going to that person or a person correcting the problem. Like if I have a problem with you, I'm going to go, I'm going to directly tell you. A lot of times people don't nowadays are not doing that. It's just not how it is, how it is. I mean, even for like men's mental health, right? For sure. That's frowned upon. You know, a lot of times people or men being judged for opening up, telling their feelings or, or explaining how they feel and vice versa. Females going to males and they're feeling like they can't come to the male because they're so or too dominant. Right. Um, I just think people are too bottled up within themselves and too cocky or arrogant to speak about how they actually feel to maybe an issue, a problem, or just about any topic that may be irritating them. They just don't want to. I mean, that's You know where... what it kind of is? Having that conversation mm -hmm. is like the suburbs. Oh, man, what? Yeah, it is. We, we feel so <laughs> safe in the hood and yeah. like, fuck, I have anxiety, I have depression, yeah. I have fucking PTSD. Yeah. That's the hood. It's like, yeah. but at least I know how to cope with it. Right. Like, for example, for your mom, it might be like, I'm feeling fucked up, but at least I know I can go drink. Exactly. And it'll go that, away for no, a little you, while. You're right on topic with it. Yeah. Compared yeah. to like, oh, I have to have this conversation with my son or with my daughter. I'm ashamed. I'm yeah. embarrassed. It's uncomfortable. 
yeah, it's the suburbs. I never been here before. Yeah. I never had knew how to have this conversation because my yeah. parents didn't have this conversation with me. Yeah. But I feel like our generation, mm -hmm. we're a little bit more open to having those conversations. We're yeah. a little bit more like knowledgeable because because of the internet, because of social media, we're able to understand that the way we grew up is not the only way to live life. Right. That's and it. What, like you said, there is positive to how we grew up. We mm -hmm. can take the good things, mm -hmm. but the bad things should stay where yeah. they were. And we should learn to pick up new habits and yeah. better traits. Like I'm sure it, it can go both ways, right? Like I'm sure it could either be really difficult for you mm -hmm. to have conversations with your kids, or mm -hmm. it can be really easy because mm -hmm. you know both ways. Yeah. It's either, you know, difficult because you're like, I never, I never had this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I'm supposed to talk to my kid. Or it can be really easy because you're like, man, anytime I get to spend with my kids, I love them. I want to yeah. treasure them. Like you said, you moved across the country yeah. to give them a better life. Facts. And that speaks to yeah. who you are as a man, who you are as a father, to be brave enough to be like, I've never even been to this city, but yeah. I'm going to make it happen because I want better for my kids than I had. Oh, yeah, man. And you touched on it again. It's easier for people to get attached to what is temporary, temporary available to, I would say, to submerge their issues, right? So my mom, it's the drinking. She knows that's going to cover her pain for the time being. And so that's that's what she's going to go to. For me, I think what helped me overcome a lot of that pain is doing what I'm giving people the opportunity now is discuss and talk about it. Like, I'm going to my mom. I'm going to my, you know, I went to my dad. I went to my brothers. I went to all the, like, the higher-ups in the gang world and was like, bro, like, I don't, I don't believe this is right. I spoke how I feel, and that's it. But the ultimate, and, and this is not for everybody, but the, the only route that I knew was to be in gang violence. But what saved me was my grandmother, my aunt, which is now my mom, and then my dad, which is also my uncle. Um, and then God. Obviously, God first. The reason why I put my granny... Um, is because she took me in, she took me to church. If it wasn't for her taking me to church, I wouldn't be probably this far in life. I'm going to be honest. Like, I don't care what anybody beliefs are. I, I, I respect it, but I'm telling y'all, like, for me, it was going to church and being, like, having religion, uh, like, in my household. And even when I was, like, living with my grandmother, bro, I was still getting in trouble. By me saying I'm a Christian does not mean I'm perfect. Of course. Does not mean just because I can recite a Bible verse does not make me more holier than thou. Exactly. Bro, I tell people all the time, and you touched on it again, I can walk into a room with the president, LeBron James, Stephen Curry, whoever it is, bro, the biggest people in the world, I can walk into that room, tell my stories. I would tell them all my negatives before my positives and walk out happier than what I ever did before. Because it doesn't matter what I say. You may have more money than me. You may look better than me, but you'll never outwork me. I may not be where you want me to be at in your in your eyes, but you will never outwork me. That's just how I that's just how I learned throughout my life from that environment. Like I wanted to be something better than this is going to sound bad, but I wanted to be something better than my friends. I wanted to be something better than my gang banging relatives. That's just how it is. No, I think it's commendable that you want to be better than what you're supposed to be because it yeah. almost feels like being in an environment being around these people mm -hmm. being in the family that you're from being whatever it is that the situation that you got placed into yeah wanting to be better than that is commendable because it's brave it means Facts. you expect more of yourself it means yeah. you're telling other people to expect more of you yeah it means you're doing something that's not easy because yeah. it would be easy to just stay there and do the same thing oh, with the same people forever yeah but that shows no growth it shows it no courage it shows no it bravery and i love what you said about religion because i always say that the cure to most of the problems most problems whether society or mm -hmm. people individually like if you don't have God, what do you have? What do you, you have? have nothing. nothing. You can't stand on anything because nothing. it's just subjective. Yeah. You don't have anything higher than you to look to yeah. when you're sad or when you're angry or when you're depressed. You don't have anything yeah. because the money is going to come and go. The people around Facts. you are going to come and go. Whatever success you think you have is going to come and go. Yeah. But the one thing that will always be there, whether you pay attention or not, is going to be God. God. I and love that. How how was your journey? Like, do you remember the first time your grandma took you to church after she took you in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't, it was on us. It was on a Saturday. She actually took me in to meet the pastor outside of church service. And that's what I will call. Like, I could call my pastor right now on the phone and she'll pick up. 
and this is a pastor that's been with me ever since I've been in middle school. Mm. So uh, she's been doing it ever since, what, 38, 39 years. So she's an OG with it. And mind you, female pastors are frowned upon within Christianity. Yeah. Oh, no, I ain't trying to hear all that. Like, I'm t- nobody can go toe to toe with her. But um, my granny took me in to meet her. She was like, hey, this is my grandson. I didn't know she was my she was the pastor, bro. Right. So and so this is a funny story, but my granny took me in. I didn't know she was a pastor. She told me we was gonna like go meet the pastor, but I didn't know who it was. I was expecting yeah. like a big bald head dude yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Like something I seen off like Sweaty's head yeah, with, with a little yeah. towel on his pocket. She was a petite lady yeah. that was like maybe five one. So I was like, oh granny, she's cute. Man, she was a pastor, dog. Nah. <laughs> Bro, my granny grabbed my hand, and then the pastor, like, pastor, uh, her, pa- her name is Pastor Faith Scott. She she grabbed my hand, and we just started praying. While we was praying, I was looking at my granny, and I was looking at her. <laughs> and then, like, my granny, she snitched on me. So we sat down after we prayed in, before any conversation that me and the pastor would have or anyone we always pray in and pray out, right? So we sit down. My granny snitched on me, man. She she was like, yeah, pastor. He said you was cute. She looked at me. She said, she was like, I know I am. I was like, oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> I was like, oh, but that first day that I met her, I, I, I'm telling you right now, I, I, I felt the burden left off my shoulder, like lifted off. From that day forward, I felt more relieved. I felt more uh i had more of a purpose 100%. and i i always felt like i had a purpose in the world but at that time before me in christ in general it was for the wrong purpose it was mm. the gangs it was everything like that and even with me having my first child he's nine so i was 17 turning 18 bro i was that sad to say it that didn't really change me fully um but meeting pastor and her guiding me through jesus christ even to this day in my current life, I'm talking about, I just called her two days ago. Like, should I get a tattoo? <laughs> hey, bro, I, it's so wild. But yeah, that. What'd she say? She said, nah. <laughs> she said, nah. Because of like the Old Testament, yeah, the yeah, Old Testament. Yeah. And she's not a big, she's she's one of them, I'm not a big negotiator type person, but I love her so much. But yeah, she said no because of the Old Testament, because you got to come as who you are in general and stay clean and fresh. Um, and you know, that's not something that I would avoid not listen to her. No, I'm, I'm listening to you hundred percent. So yeah, I, I met Jesus Christ and that's, he got me to where I'm at today. No, oh, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. Um, I want to commend you on that and congratulations yeah, on that. And, um, but yeah, I, I always say the same and not to say that therapy and religion mm-hmm. are mutually exclusive because I believe in life, in the world we live in they can both coincide right mm-hmm. they they both play their part but a lot of the things i see especially now on social media you have all these people that are like healers or spirituality yeah. and all these things and you know everybody could do their thing right it's a free yeah. country but i always saw it as people will go out of their way to come up with these really big complex like complicated fancy mm-hmm. sounding explanations for solutions or for treatments or for yeah. theories for things that you get simply by believing in God. Yeah. Like this inner peace that you get, like you said, you felt a burden being lifted off your shoulders. Yeah. Like, I'm Muslim, you're a Christian. Yeah. But I, I believe like when, no matter what religion you are, if you believe in it, right? Because I have Christian friends, I have yeah. Muslim friends. It's like you feel a burden being lifted off of you. Yeah. You feel happy. You feel like excited about life. You, you feel like forgiving people. You yeah. feel like being better every day. Yeah. And these things are free yeah it's all free. you have to do is believe in god and they're it's free, free. To you. yeah like i'm not about to if, if someone telling you to sign up for a subscription to chase jesus christ wrong yep. and i always use the one thing that helped me in life that she always told me even to this day god doesn't give you a test on purpose for you to fail exactly it, it, there's a lesson you're gonna learn from from the lesson but are you gonna either pay attention to it are you gonna ignore it are you gonna go left see God, sometimes he'll give you two paths to take the right, which is a shorter route to your goal or the left. That's a little bit longer. Which one are you going to take the clear road or the bumpy road? Not every route you're going to take in life is supposed to be clear with no bumps. Exactly. I'm going to take the hard one every time because there's a lesson. If someone came in here and told me, 
hey, I want to give you a million dollars to go run a mile. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a catch. There's a catch. Exactly. There's a catch that may not be following within my beliefs. So I'm like, no, I'll give you. All right, if you come in here and say, I'll give you a hundred million if you go run thirty miles, but you got to stop here, 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 here. Okay, that's a little bit different. Now you're adding more to it, right? And that's just an analogy. But God will never give you a test on purpose for you to fail. And so I learned that over the life, uh, over my lifespan now. Um, and it's sad to say it, but I lost some of my closest friends. 100%. Like I, I literally see seeing some of my closest friends just disappear. Once I started chasing like religion and, a, and I'm not perfect by chasing it by any means, but once I got involved into religion, God started like distancing me from everything. And soon as he started distancing me, I seen some of my friends pass away. Some of my friends get murdered. My closest friend, his name is Emra. He actually he committed uh, suicide. My other one of the leader of one of my gangs uh, in general, his name was Shavondis Martin. He uh, he got murdered by his own family member, setting him up crazy. But it, it's like anyway, God pointed me in a different direction because he saw what I couldn't see. So if you telling me to sign up for a subscription to see what God has in store for me, cap not real like it doesn't cost like you said it doesn't cost anything exactly man all of the answers are right there in the bible and a lot of times people want to read the bible and fit it to their liking it's yep. like the law you can't change you, you can't, can't change the yeah. law that's already permanently written yep you can't you you can't so in the bible all of your answers are right there now if you do exactly what it says cool but if you try to no nah, god says this but in the other verse he says this Nah, that's that the thing. That's the thing is like people think like, bro, God's watching you. God yeah. knows what's in your heart. He knows you're trying to, bro. You're trying to find a loophole, but there's no loophole. With none. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, hey. like at the end of the day, you it might be secret to us. Yeah. I might not know what the next person is doing, yeah. but God's watching you the whole time. Yeah. Like you can't hide no secrets. Facts. Yeah. And um, but is that something you keep in mind now? Because that's something I'm very like mm -hmm. cognizant of in terms of growing a platform, in terms mm -hmm. of having a business. Like I see all these people that they get on by mm -hmm. doing some crazy shit. They promote yeah. bad things or they're pushing bad things on people or mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're having all these crazy conversations that are really just for nothing on the yeah. internet. And that's such an easy way. Like you were saying, that's the easy yeah. way to the to and success and to do things the right way to avoid bad and mm -hmm. enjoying good takes so much more work and effort, mm -hmm. but it feels so much more rewarding. Oh yeah. You touched on it. You touched on it. And, no, I don't think it is hard, but I think that's what I shy away from is because one, like you mentioned before we actually started, my podcast is filmed out of my home. Mm -hmm. So like I invite people on to where I know or would be safe to be around my kids or my family if they're there at the time in general. But I'm not about to just go on the Internet and do what everybody else is doing because it'll get the likes or it'll get it'll get the the views. No, I'm going to stay true to who I am and I'm going to, you know, let it speak for itself. Like you said, it's going to take longer, but it's more rewarding. And that's what's going to make God smile the most, because I'm using one of the most evil things out there, which is social media as a positive. And you're not going to attract the people that are you know attracted to positivity if you get a lot of people attracted to your page or whatever the case is for social media right away um, for posting negative content content or whatever those are the ones that's not really chasing positivity in their life 100 percent. so like i that's fine like i'm thankful i blew up i'm not going to cap i blew up overnight and it was just like thanks to julian but it was also because he has so much negativity and I, I love the dude so much and I respect him. He's he, he's a brother to me, but it was like, it was so much negativity that he had with him that got people attracted because his name was always in the tabloids. So that's why I call my podcast Off Limits is because I don't want nothing to be off limits when you sit down and talk. I want to talk about everything, whatever's making you feel uncomfortable, whatever, you know, topics you want to talk, you know, and let everybody else guide it. I don't care about the views. I just want to care. I care about people's stories being heard. I don't care about the likes. I don't care about the shares. At the end of the day, God put it in front of me to get paid, but he's going to let me get paid eventually. Exactly. It's like if if it'll if it's going to come, it's going to come eventually. Yeah, so why be worried? Yeah, right? And exactly. that's the thing that believing God gives you is that faith knowing like, 
Yeah. If I'm supposed to have it, it's yeah. gonna come. Yeah. And if I'm not supposed to have it, why am I worried so much why about it? Why am I having worried it? about it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So God placed everything in front of me to do the podcast, and just like you, He gave you the finances to get everything set up. Hundred percent. So there's a there's an end goal out of it. There's a breakthrough somewhere. You just got to be patient and stay and stay direct. Hundred percent. And so for with me, um, I again I be I, I tread lightly of who I invite on. But again, God also gives me that availability to really know who's genuine, whose story needs to be out there um, and things like that. So I'm just grateful overall, man. And he got me to where I'm at today. And a, a lot is, I think, still left to talk about. But, uh, you know, I let God guide it, man. 100 percent, man. Yeah. I can't wait to see it, man. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about that Julian interview real yeah. quick. So how did how did that come about? Uh, Julian Newman interview. Oh man, that came deep. So actually, my old uh, videographer, he he was friends with Julian, and it was just networking. Um, I found my old video uh, videographer on TikTok, mm. and I well, I had searched up in a search bar. I was like videographers in Las Vegas because I want I knew I wanted to start my podcast, and so I hooked up with him, did a couple of videos, did his original uh, videos, and he was like, "Hey, bro, I think you should have them on." And he invited me on it and our relationship just kind of uh, kind of stuck. But then, shit, we had a fallout. I don't know what, honestly, I don't know what happened. My first videographer, bro, this is just random, but he he just randomly ghosted out of nowhere. Like, then whatever, sent me my shit, whatever, cool. Not really hanging up on it. But yeah, I met Julian from him and we kind of just... Shit, I don't know what happened with him, but me and Julian always stay cool, and we he'll he'll actually he'll call and check up on me, he'll text me or whatever, um, just based off that networking, man. So that's how it happened. And we did actually two, three interviews. Yeah, Damn. it was wild, bro. Bro just popped up at the crib one time. Was like, hey, let's do it. Let's do it, like, <laughs> hey, bro. Let's do it. Like we lit. I'm like, the fuck you mean? Let's do it. So yeah, it was yeah that was that was lit. That that's was crazy. Lit. Yeah, I feel like he's someone that's very misunderstood. He's someone that yeah he is. he was a kid when he became famous and he kind of always had to live with the mm -hmm. pressure of being in the spotlight that negative shit yes yeah. it's like everybody's so attracted to it and mm -hmm. it sucks because people just like the you know how you grew up in a gang banging environment you mm -hmm. feel like you're attracted to being a gang banger yeah. or at least being in those situations yeah, yeah. that gets you in trouble that's like negativity now like everybody yeah. grows up in negativity you almost feel like. Oh, I gotta be negative, or, yeah. or else I'm like or out I'm of corny place, or, or I'm corny. Yeah, yeah. And it's like so stupid. Yeah, no, but he was a crazy. very big victim of that. Yeah. It's like people just hated on him for no reason. For no like, reason, people that didn't even know him at all were like, yeah, oh, picking on him and shit. And, 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 and what I would say about Julian, man, and I, I had a lot, a lot of time to actually personally get to know the dude. Like he trolls a lot on social media. Yeah. He troll like, bro, biggest one of the biggest trolls on fucking social media. Outside, behind the scenes, he's still normal. He's still a, a human. He is one of the most genuine, heartful dudes that you will ever meet. I'm gonna be honest that I ever met. Like he's so he would give you his last dollar. He would give you his last meal if he had to. The stuff that people say on social media, bro, is not true. Like with him and his dad, like it's not true. Like I'm telling you, this dude. He trolls a lot with it because, again, he learned how to adapt. He of learned course. how to make bucks from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's one of the most genuine cats that you'll ever meet, man. That'll that'll be somebody that you should meet for sure because you'll be like, what? Like the social media is definitely portraying this dude to be just ignorant. And he's not. Yeah, like, yeah. I, man, dude has an open heart for sure. Salute to yeah. Julian Newman, man. Yeah, yeah hopefully sure. we're able to make it happen. Yeah, but, we uh, can set something up. Yeah, that, man, he always... He's always he obviously he lives here in Vegas, but dude be having fun, man. Yeah. Trust me, yeah. I didn't like, even know he lived here in Vegas. Yeah, he do. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. dope though. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy how he chose to come. You know here. who else lives here? Um, a big YouTuber, CJ. So cool. CJ, so cool. Yeah, he yeah, live here. Yeah. Um, yeah, he. It's a lot of influencers that live here, bro. That no, you wouldn't sure. expect. A like, lot of them. Yeah, they. So it's just networking, man. That's no, all it for is. Sure, for that's sure. All it is. Yeah, and I love that. Like, I, I love that you're someone that's so genuine. Like, um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like followed your page and shit, and yeah. you reached out, and I'm like, yeah, let's make it happen. Yeah. I love like working with people like you that are so open about collaborating yeah. and working and networking because yeah. that's what I see, especially when I go to other states like LA. Yeah, it's so toxically competitive yeah. that everybody's like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna talk to him yeah. because he talks to that person, or you know, 
I love that Vegas, we're building something so organic. It's like, yeah. oh, I know somebody. Oh, you want to get them on? Yeah, yeah. Let me put a yeah. phone call together. Let me put a text together. Yeah. And that's how we're all going to grow. Yeah, it's that's, like there's that's more it. than enough for all of us. Like, it, And that's that's all it is, is so many people want to be better than the next, better than the, the one sitting right next to them in June. That's not the goal. It's like, dude, like, I don't always need a favor in return either. Exactly. In general, like, I'll help anybody out. And that's where I feel like I will never move to L.A. because everybody's doing the same thing, but not everybody is willing to eat off the same exactly. plate. You feel me? Yeah. Like they don't want to, you know, they don't want to collab. They don't want to do all this. But then you got people on TikTok that will collab to do a dance. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, come on, man. So, no, I'm I'm always showing love. I don't care where it's at or who I'm with or who I'm around. I'm always showing love, man. God, that's amazing. And that, that, that just brings me to the topic, but God always told like he always says, like blessings come from the ones you least expect it. Hundred percent. So I bless. I, I show love and respect to everybody, man. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. What's your relationship with your kids now? Like, mm -hmm. what are the things that you're identifying that? Because it, it's almost like you have to heal your inner mm -hmm. self, your inner child, because mm -hmm. you didn't have a father present for a lot yeah. of important moments in your life. Mm -hmm. So. Are there any of like memorable moments that you have now with your kids that you're like, oh man, like I wish I had this? Yeah, honestly, just putting them to bed at night, putting putting my two little kids currently that's obviously in my household, um, putting them to laying them down to sleep at night. My two older ones, um, I would say, the most memorable thing so far that I wish I would have had is just them getting in trouble coming to me and saying, Dad, I'm sorry I messed up. Wow. That's probably the most memorable thing that I wish I had because I never had that. I never had the ability to hug somebody and be like, I messed up. I'm sorry. Let them hold me tight and let me cry in their arms for I'll a long you know time. Let know that it's okay. Yeah, so uh, me and their mom, like, we just – and I'm, I'm not name-dropping her, but obviously people would know, but, like, me and the mom, we just don't get along because they – like, my two older kids, like, they don't want to live with her. Mm. Like, they don't want to be with her. But an African-American male going up against a Caucasian female in Iowa, I had no no way of winning. And I was, I, was, I was a criminal as a juvenile. As an adult, I'm squeaky clean. Nothing. So, long story short, when we was going through the uh, custody thing, she just, when we were, she, she filed the paper correctly while I was moving. So, it got sent to the old address not to the new address here in uh, Vegas. So I never got it. So they automatically gave her the upper hand. But anyway, it was just, my kids just, yeah, that would be, that would probably be the most memorable thing that I wish I had is just them being able to come to me and hug me and cry and say, I messed up, I'm sorry. Because I tell, even now, like I tell my sisters and siblings, like it's okay to mess up. It's okay to fail. Like, man, you, man, you go to the kids in Bel Air, they all doing coke. Like, I'm going to be honest. Crazy shit, like, I, yeah, I want my yeah. kids to be able to come talk to me. So my kids come talk to me more than they go talk to anybody. That's that's how it should be. Yeah. Because so. at the end of the day, would you rather them mess up and come to you or would you rather them mess up and go to their friends or go exactly. to somewhere else that's yeah. going to give them bad advice? Yeah. At least you can be like, okay, you messed up. We're going to talk about it later. Yeah. But right now, let's get it fixed yeah. and know that I'm on your side. I'm not against you, right? Exactly. That's how it is. And I tell my oldest son, Josiah, like he's nine. I tell him like, dude like uh what went wrong like i'll ask him like what went wrong how could you you know did it better okay that's cool let's not do it again like i have more of a patience and a calm reaction to my kids messing up the mom doesn't like you know it's more or less like they just they, they can't speak their feelings with her they can't speak and open up their mind with her yeah. because she 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 got some type of evil in her like I don't hold no resent, no resentment, no nothing. Like there's so much I can touch on. Like bro, it's so crazy. And this is not me calling her out by any means. It's just I, I'm the only one that can tell my story. 100. percent And but it's just my kids. They just she always put like this narrative on me. Like I was this bad parent, not doing what I'm supposed to. Whatever. At the beginning, I wasn't there fully. Like I was supposed to be. I was a young kid. I was hot in the city. Uh, people knew who I was. I had girls all over me. Uh, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to, of course. Um, but even then, that was only like three, four months into him, you know, uh, being born. But I was only able to do so much that I was allowed 
overall. But yeah, my kids, man, coming to me, hugging me and saying I messed up. Like I did this wrong, daddy, I, I messed up. What can I do? Man, I wish I had that as a kid because I'm like, damn, even now, like I can't go to my parents. Well, no, I ain't gonna say that. I can go to my dad and be like, dad, I fucked up. He'll be like, what you do? Like, you know, but like when I was little at their age, I didn't have that. Like my role model was a gangbanger. My role model was drug dealers. So it, yeah, I wish I had that. Is yeah. your biological dad free now? No, he, no. This, this man serving life. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with his brother. Yeah, he's serving life. He'll call me on the phone sometimes and uh, we'll talk it out, like talk to, talk about everything, like laugh and make jokes. Don't get it twisted. I'm going to be honest. Like my dad pimping through the prison. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, bro, oh my gosh, yes, he's pimping through the prison. I'm going to be honest. Like, man, and I get emotional sometimes talking about stuff like this, but I, I love being open. Bro, my brother is serving life in prison. He was 17 when he got served life. So my dad, my brother, uh, his brother, dude, my dad got, what, five, six kids. It's only, well, four of us are out now. My two older brothers just got out after serving a couple years. But me and my uh, older sister, well, younger sister, Tierra, we were the only two siblings free. And, I, man, she got a niece that I only met twice. Mm. my older brother got a niece that I only met once so I yeah every my whole family was just crooked <laughs> like I'm gonna be honest my whole family was crooked but my older brother he just got out um my second older brother which I'm older than him he's doing good he's making music out of Indiana um so he's doing doing pretty good now but my younger brother yeah he's serving life and my sister she's out of Mississippi so yeah it's wild. You have very high emotional intelligence, though. Yeah, like I can tell just by yeah. talking to you, like yeah. you're very collect. Like, where did that come from? How did like how did you learn that? Like, what do you mean? Like, as in my emotional? No, like like you're very good at like emotional tensions. I mean, like the way you like deal with people, like mm -hmm. even how you speak about your kids, like yeah. It's not something that's like, oh, I like reading bedtime stories. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like oh, deep. I got it's you. like yeah. it's like oh, like I. I love that they can come to me when they mess yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Like that's something very like deep. Yeah. Like how did you learn that? Uh, my granny dog, <laughs> yeah. my granny, and then my mom, uh, which is my aunt, but my mom again. Um, where they taught me growing up, it's okay to get raised by a female. I think growing up and being raised by a female taught me how to connect with my inner feelings. So there's a plus side to that. You see a lot of males saying like no male should get raised by a female because they might become feminine, whatever the case. That did not happen with me. But <laughs> with me, it taught me that I'm okay to talk about my feelings and I'm okay to express how I feel to anybody without be maybe being judged, but I'm still gonna walk out leaving happy. So right. I think it was just my grandmother. It's she that used granny to, wisdom, bro. I like, tell everybody old if people you, are so like yeah. I love talking to old people because they got so many damn stories, bro. Yeah, like they just bro. be putting you on game about everything. Yeah, they do. Like yeah. she she put me on game a lot, man. Like I love my granny dearly. Like through all of the fights, through all the argues, like dude. Like I used to go to work with my granny for about a year, almost two years, bro, for community service. No shit. So my day, my days used to be wicked, but like I used to go to school at six o'clock in the morning, go to basketball. Um, sometimes she would drop me off at my mom house because I, she had to go to work a little bit early and she would drop me off and they would drive me to school. But typically it was six o'clock in the morning, go to school, uh, get home, go, get off from school, go play football, practice in general, get home by six o'clock um, or seven, go to work with her at nine, get off at six in the morning, go to school. I, I had to do that for community service for a, year, for yeah. a while, bro. Yeah, that's, that's how it was. So it, that's where a lot of the emotional come from, Nick. Because I saw my granny, my granny was being a slave. Yeah, she's still working at the bro. She been at the same like nursing home for like twenty four years, bro. Damn, same, and she get paid less than me now. And it's sad, bro, because like she she took care she took care of her, she took care of the whole family by herself. She took care of her daughter, like my mom, her daughter, um, her her brother. Um, she only had two siblings that, well, I mean, not two siblings, sorry. She only had two kids that grew up to do what they were supposed to do as an adult. One lives in Des Moines. The other one is my mom that I'm talking about, my aunt. 
out of her other kids in general, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's just where my wisdom came from, though. And that's man. something that's like, I don't know. This generation is kind of cooked because like, oh, you yeah. don't see those like those strong female archetypes yeah. that like they'll take care of everybody. They yeah. cook for everybody. They this take generation. care of all the grandbabies. They Trash, put them, bro. Now it's like, who Trash. the fuck is like that, bro? Yeah, like, you think about it. And I joke about this shit at work, but like I'm being for real. Like, think about it. Our generation is so fucked, bro. Like, you go to, if we want to go get some wisdom, some knowledge from somebody, you got these grandmas over here with BBLs and yep. veneers and shit. Yep. Who am I going to go to? Like, tattered like, and shit. Yeah, just tattered just and shit. <laughs> so it's like, dang, our generation cooked, bro. You're not 100%. <laughs> like, imagine going to get advice from a girl that's sick, like 40, 50 years old with a BBL. Like, what? Like, yeah, bro, what? That's crazy. Like, no, nah, I can't go. But yeah, I mean, this generation, man, it's there's not a lot of hope. In my end, there's I'm gonna be really honest, not, bro. Nah, <laughs> like, really not. That's something I noticed like day by day. And hearing these type of stories, because like my my grandmas were kind of similar. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, bro. Like, I mean, my mom's generation is still like everybody's kind of cool, but yeah. I'm, now I'm like, what's gonna happen now? Yeah, bro? Like, like, what's what gonna happen? Like, yeah. Yeah, it's sad because I'm telling you, I'll call my granny about anything and ask her the most simplest question. Like, bro, she'll still give me like she'll still give me advice on how to raise my kids. I'm like. Part and of they, me, and like, what and the they be fuck? having all the fucking remedies. Yeah, like anything bro. wrong, they're like, oh, just give them uh, oh two teaspoons of this, uh, and I'm not five milliliters of this, like everything. That shit work. Yeah, <laughs> like always. Oh, man, my granny be like, oh, I just put some ice on it. Motherfucker got a whole gash in his leg. <laughs> like, shit, like, what? Starts healing up right yeah. in front of you and shit. Like, like damn. But no, like facts. Like my granny, I'll call her about anything and everything, and she'll give me like the hundred percent, like generic answer, and it'd be correct a lot of the times, you know. And I think I held my granny to so, like such a high standard in general. Mm -hmm. It also had a negative effect too, because now I hold women to a higher standard because I got raised by females. Oh, for sure. But I wasn't always perfect. Like with my first baby mama, oh yeah, I was slinging. I'm gonna be honest, I was <laughs> I was slinging. But my second one, oh man, like Sadie, whew, yeah, that that's my queen right there. I'm gonna be honest, that's that's my queen with my two younger kids. Um, that laid like, oh my gosh, my granny taught Sadie. Like my granny taught uh, my current fiance a lot. And so I hold women to a higher standard because I got raised by females. For sure. So I mean, shit, it is what it is. <laughs> like, nah, and one thing that I like, it almost feels like back then they used to live like a longer life. Like now, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's just like, you kind of go to school, you get a job, and then that's it. That's it. It's like you don't really learn shit. Yeah, you don't. And back then, it's like <laughs> you, you actually had to learn shit. Like, yeah. like all the remedies we're talking about, it's like you can go to a doctor right now yeah. that like deals with kids, and they'll yeah. tell you like, oh, some medicine or do yeah, this yeah. or that. But it's like you go to your grandma, and they'll tell you like this, like, oh, yeah. just do this, and it's gone in like five yeah. minutes. You're oh, like, damn. how do you know this? Ain't nobody up here cooking remedies like that. Like, no, in our, in our, not like, anymore. If they, they, they cooking, they cooking some coke or some shit. Like, yeah, they doing that's something. it. That's crack. Like, they're that's not it. trying to. They're not trying to figure out no remedies to help mm, everybody else nah, out. They don't know about so, no yeah, teas, no that, fucking none of nothing, that, none bro. Of that. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just not as pure as it was back then. And I think we got our. I think this generation had our route that we had to find in general, and we just lost it, dog. Like, we all went to the negative aspect of. BBL. We're worried about likes on fucking Instagram, likes and bro. everything like, else instead fuck? of finding what the true meaning of life was in general. And so, you know, I tell people all the time, COVID was a prime example. The first thing that happened when COVID hit, God closed all his doors for the church. That's what he did. He was like, y'all ain't going to listen to me. All right, bet. I'm going to cut off all access. He closed all his doors for church. Tell me I'm wrong. Like, for real. Like, when COVID hit, they started closing the 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 church doors, the grocery stores, school. I'm like, damn. Now everybody back from COVID. But during COVID, everybody was like, oh, I need to go get right with God because everybody was dying. Oh, now you want to come. Right. Man, man, look, I'm telling you, I get deep with it. Nah, <laughs> it's sure. crazy, bro. Yeah. And it's sad because um, I love history. Like history yeah, is yeah, my yeah. favorite Fact. subject too, in too. like high school. Like I love, even till now, like I'll yeah. just sit up, like watch a random documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. about old shit. And it's sad because, like, you look at these things and you learn about, like, languages that were lost or technology yeah. that was lost and all these things. And we think about it like it's such an antiquated thing. Yeah. Bro, it's happening right now. Yeah. Like, we're talking about all the wisdom that these old people used to have. Yeah. We got these little idiots on Instagram scrolling on TikTok doing dances. Like, yeah. you're worried about this instead Boom. of that fucking wisdom that took hundreds of years yeah. that is just going to be lost yeah. bro like if Facts. we don't write it down if we don't have it with us if we don't practice it most yeah. importantly 
it's gone. Oh, like, it's gone. All that's gone. Like your little TikTok shit, up. like they say forever. Don't worry yeah, about that, bro. But like the poorest shit, yeah. that's gonna be fucking it's gonna gone. Be gone. And yeah. you know, I, and I tell bro, you might laugh at this, but like I don't know how to read in cursive. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like nah, and Sadie, she makes fun of me. Like, okay, nah, hold up, fuck that. I do know how to read in cursive some. Not like but it's efficient. Not like, it's not like I can just like at a, if you like put at some an eighth grade I, reading level. Yeah, I gotta study it first oh, before yeah. I, I you know I I translate the shit. You know what's bullshit though? It's like everybody has a different cursive font. Yeah. So like the way you write certain <laughs> letters is different. So like I gotta know like, oh, this is your R. All right. Yeah, I like, gotta know. Like, yeah. I know what an S look like. Yeah, I know what yeah. a D look like. But that just goes they stopped teaching this shit. Oh yeah, yeah. Like they stop it's not just because I forgot it or whatever, but they stopped teaching it. They I might have learned it for like two months and it was like, no, nah, next year we're done with cursing. Now I'm we're like, typing. Damn. Now we're typing. Yeah. So I was like, dang. So one time, how I figured out I couldn't read in cursive, bro. <laughs> My pastor wrote something in cursive and she told me to read it. <laughs> bro, oh my God. I was sitting there like, what? I was like trying to, like, bro, it was so bad. But yeah, that, now y'all know, bro. I don't know how to read in cursive effectively. And that's bro. how they all used to write. Old people all write in cursive. Yeah. They don't write like they regular. They don't write like regular. Yeah. They all write in like slang cursive is yeah, what I call yeah, it. Like yeah. it's not like doctors pure. writing. Yeah, bro. I'm like, damn, like gibberish. But yeah, I don't know how to read in cursive like that. I know how to read perfectly, yeah. but yeah, 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 like yeah. cursive? Oh, you can miss me with it's that shit. different shit, shit. yeah. <laughs> you give me a prescription in cur uh, cursive, now I'm like, what the fuck you give yeah, me? Then? I might fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm might be on some shit tonight yeah, yeah, right but yeah I, yeah i can't read in cursive bro yeah bro, it's wild that shit's scary that shit's mm. sad sometimes like my lifestyle like i think like even to this day like sometimes i i'm blessed but i think about it like how am i not mentally fucked like i really nah, think about same, it yeah and it's more or less like a, a blessed question no, like, for right sure, like for sure thank god i'm not but for how sure. am i not like how and you and you brought up something like therapists right I despise of therapists. Yeah, I'm the same way. I had a therapist on my podcast. Yeah. She was a sex therapist. Well, more more than yeah, just yeah, a sex yeah, therapist, yeah. but that was her main right, right. niche. I don't go to therapists because there's nothing a therapist can tell me about myself that I haven't already knew yeah. or are already found out because I went through the worst of the worst. Exactly. I've been through that make it out of 1% chance, right? I've been through that. I went through all of the negative stuff that anybody can almost go through in life other than being homeless. Homeless. I went through seeing my, my mom do drugs right in front of me. I went through seeing my friends get murdered. I went through all of that negative aspect. There's nothing that one therapist on this earth right now can tell me about myself or how to overcome a problem yeah. that I probably don't already know about myself. No, I feel the same. Yeah. It's just... It's just not me. There's nothing that a therapist can tell me that God is not going to tell me himself if I just get on my knees and pray. Thank you. So you think I'm going to I'm going to go sit my ass down in front of you in your office, pay you when I can get the answer for free a, and pay you a lot, pay you a lot when I can just pick up the Bible for 20 bucks and get the question answered. Not even like you could probably get a Bible for free. Man, you go, to get, a go to any yeah, church. You, they'll give you a they'll free Bible. It, yeah. man, if a church paying you, uh, if a church is charging you to get a Bible, then you might want to go to a different church. Yeah. But you can get the Old Testament, New Testament at a church quick. So I just don't believe in me. This is just my opinion. I just don't believe in therapists. Not the same way. It's just, there's people, now God put them on earth for a reason. There's people that need them because they can't think and overcome like how we can go to a therapist yeah. little Timmy go but like people that can have genuine conversations like this and have neutral thoughts and, and take those positives and negative conversations and not get offended or whatever the case is y'all don't need a therapist man that's just me no, so, I yeah. agree. And I talk to a lot of people about that and it's a hot take for sure yeah, because a lot of people are like, Oh, I go to therapy and it's not to say, we're not saying this to like put you down or look down on you yeah. or whatever. It's just, and again, not to say it in a cocky way, but I feel the exact same yeah. way. And sometimes I think and I'm like, damn, I really like one of the, the like what, maybe 5% of people on yeah. earth that are like that. And yeah. it's like, I am like, yeah. I, it just, you can't call it what yeah. it's not. So yeah. some people therapy really works, but I feel the same way. It's yeah. like, I've been through all these things in my life, yeah. but the fact that I've sat with myself and with God and talked it through mm -hmm. means I don't feel like I have to talk about it with another human. Yeah. And not only that, but it's like the things that I, it's like if I have something with my mom or with my yeah. sister or with this, it's like I can go to these people. Thank God they're still alive. Yeah. They're still in my life. We can work it out. Just like you. It's like you want to talk about it with your sister. Yeah. You don't have to go talk about it with a therapist. Yeah. 
your goal is to, and I hope, and I hope mm-hmm. God gives you that, the ability to have your sister on your podcast and oh, have yeah, that conversation, yeah, yeah. have that closure on and off camera yeah. so that you can both like get past that yeah. traumatic event because oh, it was yeah, traumatic facts. for it's gonna, sure. It's going to happen. And I wanted her to come on a podcast so bad. Her name is Marissa, but... Um, you know what's what's amazing is nothing but God. And I'm going to answer part of your statement real quick. But I think the reason why we're part of that like 5% is because we can, we, we know how to communicate. Mm-hmm. A lot of times the people are not wanting to communicate and really answer the question themselves. Like, am I a horrible person? It's not nothing wrong with you saying, yes, I'm a horrible person. But follow up with that and be like, okay, how can I fix it? Exactly. And I think that's what makes us different. But it's crazy because my mom... My biological mom and my sister, we just went to Disney uh, out in Cali. Do you not know that was the first trip, the first picture, the first family trip that I ever been on? No shit. Swear. And I posted on my personal page, but I'll post it on my uh, podcast page. But um, that was the first trip, the first picture I ever took with my mom. Ever. I'm being honest. Ever. Like that when I when I took the picture. I was just holding her so tight, bro. Like, and it's crazy how you don't even think about that mm-hmm. until now. And you're like, Damn. yeah, I didn't think about it until I yeah. fucking printed the picture off on my, yeah. on my, from my camera. I was like, oh shit! Like, this was the first picture I took with my mom. This was the first time of her leaving, you know, from that part of the world to come to this part of the world. That was the first time she ever put me first, bro. It's so it's it got so deep just no, by us sure. going to Disney, dog. For sure, and but it's yeah, all it's, these little things add up, and it's hard sometimes. I don't know if you feel the same way. It's hard sometimes because when you look at uh, like when you look at where you come from and mm-hmm. look at where you are now, sometimes it's a little hard not to feel like guilty, not to feel like, oh. damn, why did my brothers go and not me? Or why yeah. was it this person and not me? And then to have the added pressure of being like, damn, and I'm good and I don't even have to talk to a therapist. Like, yeah, it gives you such like imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like, you're like, why? And it's good because ultimately you're like, man, God chose me. Yeah. But then it also sometimes there's pressure because you're like, damn, yeah. he chose me. Now I can't fuck this up. I have to see the mission through. Whatever Facts. the mission is, like, how how do you deal with, like, those feelings? Honestly, man, like, I go on walks. Like, man, I go on walks. I work out. Um, been a fitness influencer for – I don't like using the word influencer behind things because I did fitness to save me ever since I was 17. But I work out a lot. Even when I go back home, like to get my kids or to visit in general, I bro. Last time I went home, I went on like eight walks within one day. Damn. Like I was walk. Like I'm not kidding you. I went on like eight walks. My granny was like, "Didn't you just go on a walk?" I was like, "Yeah," and she just let me be. She just said, "Okay," because she knew what I was like. Without like emotionally expressing that I'm going through something, she knew internally that I was going through right. something because. Every time I go home, I'm walking for miles, bro. I would walk from, I had walked from like the west side halfway to the east side, just the recent time that I was there. But um, I was walking in through those, I was walking through those neighborhoods that I grew up in. So how do I like emotionally specifically deal with it, bro? I honestly just go to walk, I go on walks and I'm not afraid to have those negative thoughts of what I used to be in. Because as I'm having those negative thoughts or those memories, I should say, of where I used to be at, everything that God wanted me to see is still right in front of me. So, like, I'm not afraid to really accept where I'm at now, but also don't forget where I came from. So for me, like, I, I'm, I'm okay, like, having those conversations of flashbacks with, you know, Sadie right now and be like, dang, Sadie. Like, I used to have, like, a lot of females back then, but I found you. And we'll laugh at those stories. We'll laugh at those. But I reciprocate the same with Sadie, too, as well. Overall, I think it's just communicating within myself before I communicate with anybody else. I'm not perfect. I fuck up. Like, Sadie will tell you, like, I cheated on her with the first baby mama. Like, Sadie will tell you, like, I'm not perfect. But I tell people all the time, like, communicate within yourself acknowledge your flaws before anybody else do and handle them accordingly. That's it. That's all you can do in life. Right. That's, that's just me. That's how I usually see it. And, you know, like I said, I, if pain come, I, I like to handle it face to face. Like I'm not about to sugarcoat what, what I did was wrong or no, I'm going to say exactly what I did was wrong. It was wrong. And I'm going to come up with a damn game plan on how I need to fix it. 
and go about it. That's just how I go about it in life overall, man. No, for sure. And I can tell you, like, the type of person who you're accountable, mm -hmm. which is hard. It's a hard skill to learn, yeah. regardless of where you come from, but especially in environments where you were so used to just justifying shit because yeah. it's like, oh, that's how I grew up. Yeah. But you're very someone that's very accountable, and you're like, no, I have to leave that behind. Yeah. And you're also, I could tell someone, like, you don't look at other people's flaws before mm -hmm. you look at your own. Like, you check yourself mm -hmm. and... It's like the Bible verse, right? Who, who, yeah. uh, he who is without sin first cast the first stone. Yeah. Is that how it goes? Yeah. Like that. yeah. So it's like it's like you have to you have to be accountable. You have to hold yourself to a high standard and let other people hold you to a yeah. high standard. That way you don't disappoint yourself and you yeah. don't disappoint them and you could do better. Yeah. Right. And and that's how it is. Like again, like blessings come from the ones you least expect it. So I treat everybody accordingly. And my pastor always, like, she always told me, she was like, I wish everyone had, like, a, a a hearing heart like you do. Because, like, you can really communicate. And one of my biggest things, which is also sometimes a red flag, is compassion. Like, I, I'm always, like, like, and I'll say this, like, in general, but, like, compassion, I'm always giving it in general without me even knowing. So, like, I just love being genuine I'm not like I I have mess up, I fuck around, I have fun, do my things in general, but again, I'm always so pure and genuine to where I tell people all the time if that's not who you can be overall or what you're trying to achieve in general, then I don't want you in my circle. 100%. And I'm I'm going to put y'all on game and y'all probably already know this, but Eric Thomas, the motivational mm -hmm. speaker, that's where I got a lot of my second thought processes from. I had to watch him to understand that there was more than one way to think. That's just how it is. I had to watch him. I understood that. It was the first video I ever saw him post. Um, it was how bad do you want it? Mm -hmm. That How bad, if you want it as bad as you, you want to breathe, breathe yeah. then you'll be successful. Right. His most famous one. But that one done something, that did something for me that I don't know if it did, did for anybody else. But when I was watching the videos back to back to back, him telling the man to go out in the water a little bit further, that was, you know, insinuating like, bro, go further down the road. There's struggle. There's more depth. There, bro. I watched that so many times to this day. Yeah. Um. He taught me that there's more than one way to think. So understanding that, and realizing that there's, you know, there's not a big distance between heaven and hell. Right. There's not a big distance. The distance between heaven and hell, in general, is your mind and your heart. Which one are you gonna one initiate it to be heaven and hell? There's you can initiate it to be whatever, but God already told you heaven is right here. If you want to live in your mind too much, then yeah, you won't be on a dark road, dog. Exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. Is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Uh, nah, man. I just I just would tell y'all, man. Just don't go out there and don't be afraid to go chase your dreams, man. Moving to Vegas was not part of my plan right away i just woke up got engaged and was like hey i want to move to vegas um don't be out there scared go get everything that you wanted don't let nobody tell you no um the people that tell you no smile and walk away and prove to them why you know prove them wrong as why they said no or turned you down or didn't come on a podcast or said you weren't good enough like, or said you need makeup or said you need to buy the better shoes or jewelry, bro. Like, don't don't fall for all of that. Just be yourself, be genuine, and go chase after your goals. And God will guide you, man. That's it. The Quan Space, ladies and gentlemen. Let them know where they can find you on social media. Yeah, man. Uh, you can get me on uh, IG, uh, Off Limits Podcast or Off Limits PC. Um, I do a little bit of fitness still. I'm not doing it as much. I've been doing it ever since I was 17. Um, but the Quan dot fitness, I'm up there doing fitness, uh, motivation, kind of just having fun. Um, but on YouTube too, as well as off limits podcast, if y'all want to tune in, check it out. Um, you know, I got to have you on my podcast I'd love now. To. I'd love to. Cause that's going to be, that's going to be, that's going to be wild. Cause I, I never been in a hot seat. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, I got to have you on my podcast, man, it. but it, it's been amazing. Thank you for having Absolutely. me for sure, Thank man. This was a time. blessing. Uh, it's always good to have these open conversations overall, I man. Agree. This this is amazing. But, yeah, I, thank you for having me, man, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, guys, please go show support on all his pages, man. Uh, there's been other. There's been another episode of the On The Run podcast, man. Make sure you sub to the YouTube, On The Run podcast, Instagram, at On The Run pod. Follow my personal Instagram at AKBTG. And we'll see you all next week for another episode, man. Peace.